We're, we're going to start. Um, I just wanted a, a few, uh, just a few warms of, warm words of welcome to a room that's not as warm as the welcome is. Um, but basically my job, and I think the school's job, is to uh, try to reduce the level of stupidity um, in our field. And that project to uh, reduce the level of stupidity accelerates enormously whenever Professor Stieglitz is in the room. So I just want to say uh, again uh, how uh, amazingly generous he is to return to this space uh, and to help us to understand better the world that we're in. And every time there are ripples that go on and on and on. And I don't want to embarrass you about that. Um, but I think there are, I suppose, in every epoch certain characters who have the capacity to uh, env envision what is happening and to describe it in such a way that it almost forces multiple levels of feedback and surely Professor Stieglitz is one of those people. And a perfect demonstration of that is the sort of spectacular panel that's in this room. You do a great honor to the school. It's entirely undeserved. Um, but if you ever feel like making the same mistake again, please do. Uh, welcome back and uh, to all of you who are here, uh, thanks for coming. This is. Uh, an intersection between an amazing uh, program of echogram number three uh, that has just been an astonishing uh, set of reflections about Africa from, from the point of view of architecture, but the point of architecture also means dance and art and literature and science and so on. But it's also the in intersection crossing over with an amazing series for the Committee for Global Thought. So again, once again, the Committee of Global Thought is an incredibly uh, natural partner to us. Um, some might argue that architects were the first global professionals. Um, architects were on the road. The medieval masons were not at all anonymous. Their signature is to be found. They were enormously arrogant. Their signature is generally, as you walk into any of those buildings, their signature is there. They cruised Europe continuously advising uh, nobility that the, the other mason who had done it before was no good. Um, we were very, very quick to become attached to airlines. Nobody knows airline seats like architects and airline schedules. So the pathetic species that we are, the one thing we have almost without realizing it developed an intelligence about is the uh, global environment that we find. So for, to a certain extent, architects are ready for this conversation. And we look, very fo we look forward a lot to the leadership of the Committee for Global Thought. Okay, long word of welcome. Thanks for coming. And let me thank all of you for coming. Uh, this is the first panel of, uh, of the year uh, sponsored by the Committee of Global Thought. And we're having a whole uh, series during the year on uh, the world in Africa. Um, and I also want to thank Mark, uh, Dean of the uh, School of Architecture. And uh, it, this is, as he mentioned, part of their third annual Echogram Conference called the African Decade. So. Uh, Tonight we're going to be uh, discussing global aid in Africa, and I'd like to introduce the uh, two very distinguished panelists we have. Uh, on my left is Paul Eisenman. Uh, I knew Paul uh, very well while he was working at the World Bank, and after uh, he uh, left the World Bank, he was head of the DAC committee, the Development Assistant Committee of the OECD. Uh, he was head of the Division of Policy Coordination at, uh, at that committee. And his recent work has focused on global programs in health, education, nutrition, uh, accountability, and transparency, uh, but also on, uh, I gather, air architecture and allocations. Okay, so, so. Uh, A different kind of architecture. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, uh, Louis Kasakendi uh, uh, also worked with me at the World Bank. He was executive director of the World Bank when I was there. Uh, now he's uh, acting deputy governor of the Bank of Uganda, uh, and uh, he was uh, the uh, from 2006 to 2009 he was uh, uh, chief economist of the African Development Bank, uh, where I uh, uh, last visited it in January, uh, and uh, the African Development Bank. Uh, under under uh, his uh, leadership as chief economist has really achieved a real prominence in uh, uh, advice in, in in conceptualizing development in Africa 
and they were all very sorry that he left uh, to go back to Uganda, but uh, uh, I say Africa is lost, uh, is Uganda's gain. Uh, and his research focuses on macroeconomic and financial policies, including liberalization, structural adjustment, uh, and African economies in the global economic cri crisis. Uh, what, the way we're going to structure this is uh, the focus, uh, as I say tonight, is on uh, aid in Africa. And uh, I'm going to ask both of them to give a, a, a 10 minute uh, introductory uh, remarks. Then I'm going to ask uh, a few questions, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the dis uh, to discussion. Uh, I didn't ask you, who do you want to begin. Your choice. Okay, Paul, do you want to begin? Okay. And then, sure. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joe and uh, Mark. Uh, I'm really uh, honored to be uh, here with you and. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a number of the points that uh, uh, I've learned and colleagues that I've worked with on issues of aid effectiveness have uh, learned that are, uh, uh, I think, relevant about uh, aid to Africa and uh, development in Africa. Um, this is, I want to cover more than there's time for, so I better get uh, going right in there. First uh, lesson that uh, I've uh, certainly learned over uh, time is don't overestimate the importance of aid. Uh, many people, including Moyo, Easterly, Sachs, and in fact many donors do overestimate that influence. Uh, Moyo, for example, for example, rightly notes the correlation between poor progress and aid dependency, but I think she gets the causality reversed in general. Except that she does have, I think, one really important point. Too much aid for a given country's circumstance can not only distort exchange rates, but more importantly, too much aid where governance is weak can make donors into codependent enablers of poor policies and of weak institutions. So if aid to Africa were to rise rapidly, to the very, very high levels recommended by Jeff Sachs, we'd all have reasons to worry. There is, regrettably, though, very little risk of that <laughs> happening. Uh, second, on the other side, is don't underestimate what aid can do to help countries that are trying hard to help themselves. If aid is really so terrible, as Moyo and Easterly tell us, then how about Rwanda? How about Mozambique? How about Ghana? How about Tanzania, who've gotten high and sustained and increasing aid uh, levels? Uh, and I should add uh, Uganda into the uh, list, who are doing very well, apparently, in spite of this uh, aid. And of course, there are many examples outside of Africa of countries that have gotten a whole lot of aid that are doing extraordinarily well. Uh, Vietnam is a uh, striking example there, but uh, Bangladesh with its <coughs> social accomplishments in spite of governance problems, another. Um, next, in reality, more aid is needed for Africa, but for Asia as well. Uh, but the emerging need for belt tightening in donor countries threatens their past promises of increases in aid. And this points to the need for more attention to innovative and sustainable financing such as through a Tobin tax. But we need to recognize that political leaders in donor countries are likely to treat these flows as fungible so that their medium term additionality is far from assured. Uh, there's also uh, more attention needed to mechanisms to reduce risks of internal uh, shocks, including through the uh, newly socially conscious uh, IMF, and we were just talking before about uh, how long would, would that last, but uh, IMF certainly seems to be changing. Next, policies are crucial. We all know that. And we all know that policies are in reality pretty highly endogenous. They, they come from the underlying uh, governance uh, and institutional situation. But that doesn't reduce the importance of set 
of setting the best feasible policies for a given uh, institution. And uh, for example, uh, we've seen uh, many uh, African countries that have used fiscal and exchange rate policy to react effectively to the uh, ongoing global economic crisis, and Uganda uh, is indeed uh, one of those. And uh, as a result of that crisis, of course, ideas on good policy are changing. The mainstream has recently moved significantly to what uh, Joe and his co-authors have referred to as a visible hand. Now, there's plenty of room for argument on a case-by-case -case basis, as well as uh, on a general basis, for just how visible that hand uh, should be and which countries are capable of uh, what kinds of manipulations with those hands. Uh, next point. Um, there should be a, a frank dialogue with a lot of empathy on the part of donors and a lot of listening. I think we've, we've all learned the hard way that neither externally imposed conditionality nor high levels of budget support for weak development programs will lead to sustainable results. Rather, what I've learned anyway is that donors should think of countries facing problems as if they were cousins, as if, as if they were members of their same family to be treated with respect and also with frankness. Uh, Joe Stiglitz's ideas get listened to in part because he's a, a brilliant and persuasive economist, but it's in part also because cousin or maybe uh, Uncle Joe <laughs> is a good listener who acts like a member of the family. Uh, now, we were talking uh, before this uh, meeting about uh, conditionality, and uh, you know, there's different kinds of conditionality. There's the ex ante kind, you must do this, or we'll cut your, aid. we won't give you aid, or we'll cut it. There's indirect conditionality that comes through the allocation process, or that comes through saying, we'll give you budget support for what you have done after the fact, we won't tell you what to do, we'll give you budget support after the fact. In a sense, they're all conditionality, but there's an, a very important issue of respect. And I think that really does uh, uh, matter uh, a lot. Uh, next, uh, well, um, let me skip the, the next point for uh, now, save, uh, save time. Um, next, focus on sustainable results. And that is, in a nutshell, the, the argument underlying the Paris Declaration and the CRA agenda for action that I, I hope most of you uh, know about, an agreement between the donors and uh, developing countries and civil society about kind of rules of the game for relations between aid uh, donors and uh, developing countries getting aid. And that's why uh, this focus on sustainable results. There's so much emphasis on national ownership, on coordination or so-called harmonization, alignment of donor assistance behind government programs. What governments do is an awful lot more important than what donors do. And developing countries need to seize the opportunities that this set of agreements in Paris Accra has given them to hold donors accountable uh, and um, uh, the, some of the same countries that, that I have uh, mentioned uh, have also set a very good uh, example of holding donors um, accountable. And I think in this context, uh, Easterly's model of aid searchers who largely bypass governments looking for bottom-up approaches uh, would be a big step backward uh, in terms of uh, aid effectiveness, but also uh, politically. There are indeed lots of capable governments in Africa, as elsewhere, uh, that uh, have been doing a lot and merit support. Now, I think I can't talk and we can't talk about Africa without talking about fragile states. Uh, unfortunately, Africa has more than its fair share and there's a very broad consensus that ignoring them would be at the peril of their populations, of those of their neighbors, and of global security. There's an awful lot that can be done 
including through NGOs in those situations, but it should always be with the idea of contributing to longer run capacity and in institutions. Some have argued that half of aid should go to fragile states, but I think this is justified only by an econometric slate of hand that I will not describe, but if anyone wants to ask me about it, I'd be happy to tell you. Um, and you don't need to be concerned, to, to agree with Moyo and Easterly to be concerned about waste and to be concerned about adding inadvertently to state fragility. So it's, it's important, but it's tough. Um, and now let, let me say a word about the dangers of a disease that aid has long suffered from, which is fadism. The idea is whatever we've done in the past, that was wrong. Now, finally, we have the answer. And here are three recent fads that particularly affect aid-dependent countries in Africa. First one is that most aid should disperse primarily against monitorable short-term results. And in fact, linking aid to results is important. But what we see in practice is insufficient focus on the institutions and the capacity required for sustainability of results. And the problem is that much worse in practice when donors, in their zeal for results and for value for money, are seduced into taking over the design and monitoring and often the choice of what's to be financed. And that leads to the second fad, that of global sectoral initiatives. We should, for example, in Africa do much more on infrastructure. And we should do more on agriculture. And we should do more on health. And we should do more on education and other sectors too. Indeed, where shouldn't we do more? <laughs> Aid donors can go to high level meetings several times a year and promise that no good program in that priority area will go unfunded. And often, these sectoral initiatives are accompanied by earmarked global uh, funds, uh, which may be dispersed on results, uh, short-term results or not. And it's not that these initiatives don't have some real justification, one by one. They do. There are important issues of global public goods or giving a global push to high return neglected issues. The issue is rather the, the adding up problem and the related distortionary impact on the country priorities that donors have agreed in the Paris Declaration, the Accra Agenda for Action, to align themselves behind. So they said, look, we want to support your priorities. But then they go and they set up all these global programs that preempt the country priorities. And if they get too big, that's a real uh, problem. Uh, third and uh, finally, we're now in the week following the MDG summit. Uh, their impact has been much debated. Uh, in my view, they've had a huge, even if it's hard to quantify, impact on public and political support for aid. And they've helped recipient countries as well as donors to stretch further. But I think their biggest problem is that they're often used in an exclusionary way. Quite the opposite of what, they w what was intended when they were launched about 15 years ago, they were then, they were first called the DAC goals, then they were the International Development Goals, then they became uh, the Millennium Development Goals in 2000. For example, secondary and higher education is not included. Uh, nor is the health of males over five years old, unless from specified communicable diseases. Um, as Adrian Wood, who some of you know, has put it, MDGs should be taken seriously, but not literally. His point applies, of course, to the other fads mentioned and beyond. Um, can I have one more minute or? Uh, last point, leadership is crucial. Leadership can take different forms, but what's needed is commitment to development relative to private objectives of national leaders and the capacity to get development programs carried out. Without that, aid can certainly help build capacity for the future, but the dialogue on policies and institutions is likely to be a dialogue of the deaf. And I've, I've, I've been there. 
Um, but note that effective development leadership can take quite different forms. I think all of us in this room believe very strongly in democracy and in human rights. But some who see democracy as a precondition for success in poverty reduction and in MDGs don't want to recognize that there are fairly authoritarian regimes in Africa and elsewhere that have achieved extraordinary uh, progress. And then some, uh, like uh, Moyo again, counsel autocratic governance, understating both the successes, the real successes of democracies in Africa and elsewhere, and the likelihood of choosing the wrong autocrat. So I will uh, stop there. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'll cover six areas. Um, the first one deals with the diversity of the African economies, how the crisis has reconfigured the role, image, and capacities of the Bretton Woods institutions, how the crisis will also affect uh, aid over the long term, the specific policies, I think, that countries have implemented in the wake of the crisis, and then the role of the Africans. Whenever we talk about Africa, we should never look at it as one Africa, and I think the first speaker has touched on, uh, on this issue. We have resource-rich countries, we have resource-poor countries, and we also have the fragile states that uh, he touched on. This means that there are large differences between African countries in respect of their need for aid and the modalities in which aid uh, should be delivered. It's not useful to discuss aid to Africa without taking account of these uh, differences. My main point, I think, is all slightly different from the first speaker but I, in part agreeing with him that aid is most needed in the fragile states. Where the state capa capacities have been eroded and in some cases have collapsed, revenue mobilization is weak and private investment is low. But this is also where it is often most difficult to spend aid and meet the strict criteria and conditions imposed by aid donors. The priority for many of these fragile economies is to rebuild a functioning state which can provide essential public services and create the conditions for sustainable economic recovery. These countries need aid. Unfortunately, donor agencies often fail to provide sufficient aid to support government budgets in the fragile states, to support the rebuilding of the state and public services because of fiduciary and other concerns. In this country's aid bypasses the government budget and does not contribute to the rebuilding of the state. To me, this is being short-sighted by aid donors because it is difficult to raise the fiduciary standards without strengthening the state capacities. And we also need to change the aid allocation mechanisms used by the Bretton Woods institutions to take account of this fact, when I was still at the, World, at the African Development Bank, we started a study to look at ways of changing the CPIA to include vulnerabilities of countries in the aid allocation formula. Now, in contrast to the fragile countries, almost 20 African low-income and middle-income countries have sustained strong economic growth for over a decade. Some of them have acquired the status of the frontier markets. They are on the path towards emerging market status. Many of these countries want to reduce aid dependency because it is regarded as being macroeconomically and fiscally unsustainable and a threat to sovereignty. To achieve this, they are strengthening their domestic tax systems, they are deepening their domestic bond markets, and in some cases, Ghana, Gabon, 
and Senegal. Kenya is also in the pipeline and Uganda. They are looking to access external commercial debt by issuing sovereign bonds. Unfortunately, we sometimes impose constraints on these frontier countries because they are post-hippic countries and constrain their access to non-concessional resources. For these countries which seek to reduce aid dependency, the multilateral institutions should aim to channel more funds to the private investors on commercial terms through the private sector investment arms. Although private investment has increased in many of these countries in the 2000s, it is still much lower as a share of GDP than in the high growth economies of East Asia. Moreover, the continued growth of private investment in Africa could be threatened by global shortages of investment funds or greater risk aversion on the part of private investors. Therefore, the IFIs could play a useful role in providing equity and loan finance to the private sector in Africa. The IFIs could also channel some of this money through the regional development banks. The second area is how the crisis has configured the role, image, and the capacities of the Bretton Woods institutions. What we had during the crisis is less conditionality, more flexibility, and a combination of medium long-term financing and a short-term crisis response. The economic crisis affected Africa through a negative shock to the balance of payments, lower commodity prices, reduced demand for the exports and tourism, lower FDI. Hence, what the African countries required most to offset the impact of the crisis was balance of payments support. To be effective in meeting the needs of the African countries, the balance of payment support had to be made available for quick disbursement and to be relatively free of conditions which could have restricted its use or delayed disbursement. The IMF was able to set up balance of payment finance to countries facing temporary balance of payments difficulties. The global economic crisis, in my view, has given a new lease of life to, to, to the IMF. Prior to the crisis, it was becoming largely irrelevant in many parts of, uh, of the world. But to its credit, the fund quickly set up a range of new lending facilities to meet the requirements of its members, including the African countries. Indeed, Kenya and Tanzania, among others, have access to resources under the exog exogenous shock facility. The African Development Bank also introduced uh, new lending instruments for its regional members. One of those facilities it introduced was the emergency lending facility, and we had a lot of debate as to whether a development bank should introduce an emergency lending facility that provides quick disbursing to countries. Some people felt that that should be a role for the IMF. But there are these tensions between development financing and uh, financing from the IMF. Uh, this was uh, a fund mainly targeted to central banks, uh, private sector, and the middle income uh, countries. The African Development Bank also introduced a trade finance line of credit which provides short-term lines of credit for trade finance to commercial banks. This again was another new area for the African uh, Development Bank. However, our biggest challenge was designing an instrument to respond to the requirements of the low-income countries. They are referred to as the ADF or IDA uh, countries. These countries needed budget support to offset shortfalls due to falling commodity prices, exports, and terms of trade and tourism. Two was infrastructure financing for key long-term development-oriented infrastructure projects. And three, supporting the private sector development through leveraging of the ADF. Even the frontier countries that I talked about earlier, 
the likes of Botswana, uh, the likes of Namibia, even South Africa, they preferred budget support to close infrastructure gaps as opposed to uh, balance of payment support for purposes of uh, financing of exports or, or building up of, uh, of uh, reserves. So there is this <coughs> challenge of having a resource that meets the requirements of, uh, of the countries. Now, how will the crisis affect aid over the long term? In the first half of the 2000s, the industrialized countries, which are the maj major aid donors and contributors to the IFIs, made ambitious pledges to increase aid over the long term in the context of meeting the Millennium Development Goals. However, it would be prudent to treat these pledges with a great deal of skepticism. The public finances of the major donor nations are under enormous strain because of the global economic uh, crisis. Um, let me then move on to the non-traditional uh, donors. My view is that the non-traditional donors, including China and India, are likely to play a more prominent role in the long term in Africa than has so far been the case. China is likely to be the foremost among all the non-traditional donors. Its financial support to Africa is likely to increase because of the enormous financial resources at its, at its disposal, and also because it wants to use these resources to further its own commercial and political interests. The uh, availability of Chinese aid and commercial financing on a large scale offers major benefits for Africa. It carries less overt conditionality than aid from Western countries and the IFIs. It is often used directly to develop productive resources in Africa and to build the infrastructure which is needed to complement production. Therefore, Chinese aid may prove to be more conducive to long-term growth and structural transformation than traditional Western aid. Nevertheless, there are some valid criticisms of Chinese aid, notably the lack of transparency in some cases, which could involve African countries selling their natural resources too cheaply to obtain aid. Now, the next area is what are the specific policies that have been implemented in the wake of the meltdown in the financial markets and their implications for African development. The policy responses of African countries to the global economic crisis have been heterogeneous and have in part depended on the financial, financial resources available to each country and government on the continent. Countries which prior to the onset of the crisis had sustainable fiscal positions and sufficient international reserves to fund modest and temporary budget balance of payments deficits have implemented counter-cyclical monetary and fiscal policies intended to prevent output from falling too far below, the, below potential. The resources for governments to implement counter-cyclical macroeconomic policies, or at least to avoid having to implement pro-cyclical fiscal tightening, have also been boosted by the IMF, World Bank, and AFDB, as I pointed out. The long-term implications for development are difficult to predict, but in some senses, they are positive, in that governments in Africa have gained more confidence in their own ability to manage their economies, even in the face of severe external shocks. Especially because macroeconomic management in Africa has been relatively successful, most economies have avoided a recession. As a consequence, <coughs> African policymakers are likely to become more assertive in future in terms of formulating their own economic policies independently of the IFIs. 
the global economic crisis has also undermined confidence in the efficacy of orthodox neoliberal economic policies across a wide range of issues, from industrial policy to financial liberalization and food security. As a consequence, it is likely that African countries will adopt more heterodox policies in the future, with probably a larger role for the state in allocating resources in commercial sectors. I think this is the visible hand that uh, was, uh, was referred to. And uh, Malawi started a program of giving fertilizers to, to farmers. This was before, uh, before the crisis to boost domestic maize production, a policy which is regarded as being quite uh, successful and will therefore probably be emulated elsewhere in Africa. Ethiopia and Rwanda are also leading the way in using smart government interventions in a wide range of areas intended to boost economic growth and improve welfare. Now, what role do African actors and institutions play in framing the implementation of aid? Despite all the rhetoric about global partnership between aid donors and recipients, and about shared objectives, which has characterized global fora on aid, African governments still play only a marginal role in shaping aid policies. Africa has too small a share of the voting power at institutions which actually have financial resources for funding development, meaning the World Bank and IMF. So the African countries have very little influence over the policies. They have a larger voice in United Nations, but the UN agencies are not major funders of aid other than humanita for humanitarian purposes. I think I should stop there for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, to get the discussion going, I, I, let me ask you a, a couple questions. Uh, the first question is more of a, partly a statement, but also a reaction. A, as you know, there's been a lot of criticism of aid uh, from people uh, like uh, Easterly and, and, and a number of other people, um, and uh, suggesting that aid hasn't been very effective. Um, and uh, there's a somewhat of a literature that's developed in trying to explain why it might not have been effective. So. I want to uh, mention a couple of the arguments and get your response uh, to those arguments. Um, one of them is that aid is very much like uh, natural resources and is subject to the Dutch disease problems. <coughs> that is to say, uh, there's something, uh, it's called the natural resource curse. Countries with large amounts of natural resources haven't done very well on average. Uh, and there are uh, three reasons for this. One is that uh, the influx of foreign money leads to appreciation of the currency. This is a technical argument, but when you are a currency appreciates, it's very difficult for employment, uh, job creation, and so it actually is counterproductive. Uh, the second uh, concern is that natural resources are very unstable, and one of the concerns is that foreign aid has been very unstable. One of the arguments Dex Zapatero gave a talk uh, uh, last week here, said that the reason that he was supporting a financial transaction tax to uh, uh, support foreign aid was it would be a steady source of money for aid. And there's a whole initiative on, on, on uh, innovative means of finance to give a, a assured support to avoid this variability. And the third is one that alluded to a little bit that uh, uh, because it's not earned money, you get a lot of rent-seeking behavior, that, that there's a lot of rent-seeking behavior associated with, with natural resources, and some people claim that's also true uh, of aid. So these are three, three arguments that have been put forward for the Dutch disease of natural resources, and some people claim there's a great deal of similarity with aid uh, in that, and that's one, these are some of the reasons why aid is ineffective. There's one more I want to put forward, which uh, um, uh, blames the IMF. We try to get somebody from the IMF here. Uh, 
to, to uh, explain, uh, to, to defend uh, their position. Um, but th that argument is one of the reasons that aid may be ineffective is that uh, the IMF uh, tries to countervail the um, Dutch disease problem and forces governments to put the aid effectively into reserves. So the result of this is because they're worried about the macroeconomic effect, it is un the effect of aid in a macroeconomic sense is undone by central banks and, and uh, or basically by IMF insisting on, re on reserve accumulations, which mean that in fact, there isn't more money. And there have been some studies actually done by the IMF which show that there's actually more than a little truth in this allegation. So I'd just like to get your, your views on, on, on that issue. Uh, I think th there is some truth in uh, your first, fourth point on uh, placing uh, aid in, re in, uh, in reserves, but I think it has to be put within a context. My view is that you need a medium-term expenditure framework designed by the government, and then government looks at different sources of financing. Some of the sources would be domestic, and the other sources would be aid. And just like for natural resources, you need to have a medium expenditure framework that is consistent with certain desired growth levels. If you don't do it that way, then you will have an expenditure framework that is influenced by aid and uh, you will go through the cycles as aid comes in, you increase your expenditures, as it goes down, you reduce your expenditures. What we did in Uganda was to have such a medium expenditure framework and donor resources came in to finance the financing gap. To the extent that we got more than what we required, the excess was put into reserves. That's why I said that uh, there is an element of, of truth. So whether you are dealing with, uh, with uh, natural resources or aid, you must have an expenditure framework. The government must design an expenditure framework and then align resources to financing that expenditure framework. Paul, you're in. Yeah, uh, let me add a couple of things. You know, Joe is um, alluding to uh, the pretty extensive uh, literature, not only on you know, why has aid uh, not been effective, but whether aid has been effective and um, for those who, who are uh, interested and haven't seen it, if you Google uh, Arndt, A-R-N-D-T, and Finn Tarp, T-A-R-P, you will come up with an article that at least some of the people I've talked to have said is the, the latest one to be beat. All these articles eventually get beat, but this is the latest one, and it says, in fact, that uh, you know, aid has been a lot more successful than people have given <laughs> credit for, and you know, you've got this uh, this problem, uh, econometric and 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 practical. Um, if the countries that are doing well, you give less aid to, and they graduate, and the countries that are doing badly, and you really want to help, you give more aid to, it becomes very it, it becomes very difficult to figure out you know, uh, which way is the causality uh, going? And um, so, so I, but anyway, take, can, do can, take. Can I just yeah. uh, mention there, uh, uh, there, there, there are some uh, econometric techniques that some people use, you may want to comment. Uh, there was one study that looked at it in the following way. Uh, it turned out that uh, countries, uh, the allegation is that countries that voted with the United States uh, in the Security Council or in the UN got more aid. So that was uh, a case where aid is correlated with uh, politics, not with need. And then they looked at do those countries that get more aid because of the politics do better or worse? I can't remember what the answer is, but, <laughs> but uh, the, the, there are these techniques that try to look at that. Do you have any view on, on those papers? Well, 
if, I mean, first of all, if anyone tries to say to you that political factors do not influence aid allocations, maybe they'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge <laughs> uh, <laughs> along with that. But so what? I, you know, when you the, the point is when you add up the aid receipts, you have to see how much of a bias uh, is there, and. Um, I, it, 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 seems, uh, it seems to me that uh, econometricians are never going to really resolve this kind of a problem of whether taking account of, uh, of issues of need, taking account of political issues, has uh, and taking account of the country's capacity to use money well. You know, you talk about performance, that sounds terrible. But if you say, should you take account of what you think the likely use of the money is going to be? Well, who would be, you know, uh, j just imagine that you're, uh, it's a question of giving money to different members of your family or lending money. You're going to say, gee, some of them really, uh, if I help them out, they're going to do very well with that, and others are not. And so when you get into these arguments about Dutch disease and all that, which certainly is true. I mean, if you get a big windfall, whether it's aid or, or minerals, you're going to have difficulty. But the donors recently, in any event, seem to have been concentrating on both trying to provide more aid for the countries that really are helping themselves, that have demonstrated they are uh, going to do it, but at the same time, trying to find ways of dealing with the issue that both Lewis and I raised of, my God, the consequences of abandoning the countries in need are, uh, are pretty serious. You know, let, let me ask one more question before opening it up. And, and you, you, Lewis, you, you, you talked about the uh, China, which you, you listed as a non-traditional donor. Actually, I think China has actually been in, involved in Africa for a very long time, although not to the extent that it has been recently. But the, the subject of, of uh, Chinese aid to Africa has gotten a lot of attention in the United States. And a couple questions I wanted to ask and get both of your views on. One is that, that China uh, makes a great deal of claim about uh, non-intervention in the internal affairs of, of other countries. And uh, uh, you mentioned uh, that, that in some sense uh, was a positive thing because they were imposing less conditionality. Um, those who are advocate conditionality would say it's a negative thing. A lot of people in the American human rights community are very worried about that lack of conditionality, the implications for uh, Sudan and for, for other countries. Um, the response that they say is, well, uh, why, why is the West suddenly getting religion uh, when for 50 years you never worried about these issues? So I'd just like to get your view on that. The second one is, there, there are a lot of allegations that uh, China is mainly there for natural resources. Um, but at the same time, China has been engaged in countries like Ethiopia where there are very few natural resources. And uh, just, get, again, get your view is, is to what extent is, the, is their aid disinterested? And third is that uh, while there, there are economic interests, there are also political interests. And it's very clear, at least as I see it, the, uh, of China's increased influence uh, in uh, Africa uh, and uh, the concern about uh, of many Americans is that uh, we've been, uh, America has been very absent in a Africa, particularly recently, accepting some very localized area uh, like uh, uh, AIDS medicines. Um, and is this a subject that the U.S. should be concerned about? If, if you were giving advice to Obama, would you say, uh, uh, should you give more aid and in what form? That's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> That's more than one question. <laughs> but we'll tell him whatever you say, so, so it's serious. I, I, I'll start with the um, two issues about donors. I think, uh, as Paul said, Underlying the giving of aid are interests of the donor. I think uh, you can never run away from, from that. I think whether you are dealing with China or any of the other traditional, uh, traditional donors. 
that's one. The second one, which is still very debatable, is whether these conditionalities have actually worked in, uh, in Africa. I think what we had during the crisis was that uh, let's go in with less conditionalities, and uh, you, we saw that with most of the IFIs and development banks. And there are many people who now say that because we were able to react fast with less conditions, we were able to avert a crisis. So there is the whole issue of whether we should <coughs> always be increasing conditionalities or not. The fact of the matter is, yes, uh, China has come in. It has got its interests. And uh, natural resources are some of its interests. And it is coming in with this policy of non-intervention. That's the way they have sold it. Uh, my view is more of a message to the African countries than even this whole debate between traditional and non-traditional donors. The message to the African countries is that we may have made mistakes over the post-independence period as we dealt with the, the traditional donors. If we are not careful, we might make mistakes in our relationship with the uh, with uh, China. I think we must have our own development programs and negotiate with China to align resources to our own development programs. Otherwise, they will come and I say, we need a road from A to B, which may be a road from here to a mine. Look at the map of Africa. Look at the railways and the roads that were constructed during the colonial times. They were constructed in a manner that was intended to, to exploit the natural resources of, uh, of, uh, of Africa. You look at that map of Africa, there's very little that connects landlocked countries across uh, Africa. Most of this was roads and lairs to the sea. China might come in and just also construct other roads and lairy lines and whatever to get minerals and oil out of Africa. So it has to be the African countries to come up with their own development plans and talk to donors to align resources to those uh, uh, development plans. And I think the example you bring out of Ethiopia, Ethiopia to me is one of those countries that clearly has a vision of where it wants to go and deals with donors given that uh, vision and as is very selective between donors. They know that China is very good in this area and they want to deal with China in those areas. And I, I think it has benefited a lot from its aid program with, uh, with China. And I think the other African countries should emulate that. Otherwise, we are likely to make the same mistakes of having roads, lairs leading to exploitation of natural resources. Look, I agree with what Lewis has said, and I'd like to get on to uh, other questions. I'll just put a couple of things on, let's say, add a couple of things. Uh, on China, um, you know, China is getting to be a very big economic power. Clearly, I mean, if you think about it, its aid to Africa is not that dissimilar to, we were talking before, Japan's aid. Uh, to Africa and to Asia at an early period. Now, Japan still has commercial uh, interests, still has political interests, but Japanese aid has changed an awful lot. Maybe partly tied, but it's less tied. There's a lot more support for country programs coming from Japan. And, you know, China is, is growing so rapidly, it's so big that I, I think if China is treated with respect in the aid community, it's not going to drop its interest in natural resources uh, tomorrow or even 15 years from now. But I think you can see on their side some corresponding changes of behavior. And as, you know, as Lewis said, the, the, the African countries need to assert themselves uh, more. As far as the U.S. goes, um, I, I think you've, uh, you've put it about, uh, about right, Joe, because there was an answer implicit in your <laughs> question, strangely <laughs> enough. And, and there, sh there needs to be less, more support, you know, uh, that is not tied to very specific things. HIV AIDS is a horrible problem, it's terrible. 
But for the U.S. to put $15 billion into that and almost, uh, and very, very little into health in general, uh, that's not the right thing. And in fact, uh, President Obama has talked both about a broader initiative on global health and taking this money that was reserved for just HIV, HIV AIDS, and using it more generally. And it ought to be for those countries that particularly that are doing well, much more general support for the public expenditure program, as Lewis said, uh, of the countries themselves. And one other radical thing might be to suggest uh, to President Obama that there may be something to learn from other countries. And we were talking before about how DFID has become a leader. And it, it, it's really interesting there's been a change in government in DFID. And there are changes in aid policy. But from our point of view, they are tiny. I mean, there's a real continuity, and there is there a support for overall country programs. Some selective stuff in uh, sectors. So maybe the idea that we don't all have all the answers would be another thing to say. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, DFID is the British aid agency. Let's open it up to the audience. Do we have a microphone? Did anybody? No. Okay. Well, you either have to talk with a loud voice or um, come. There is a microphone. I don't see. What? Hi. Thank you. Um, my question is, and I don't really, you know, uh, there was a lot being said about states needing to have um, greater capacity and greater say. Um, my question is, how do you think that African states can leverage themselves with donor um, agencies, both China and, you know, other large donor agencies, in order to have a greater say in aid processes? Yeah, I'm going to gather two or three questions at a time and, and then let, let you answer them. So can you just run? Uh Hi. Uh, I'm also wondering about the role of um, a couple of other actors in development and aid. Specifically, I'm thinking of international organizations such as Médecins Sans Frontières, the Soros Foundation, um, Action Against Hunger. And then the role or if what you make of South-South cooperation. That's something that the UN is pushing, I know. Um, that's all. There's a question down here. Oh, y here he is on the side. You can give a okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, with everybody mentioning the role of, Indi of China and uh, India, perhaps, and different agencies, DFID and the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, how is it possible? to monitor all this kind of aid and if uh, what is the future of the aid structure as you see from 10 years from now as you have all these agents competing with each other and uh, if money is to be put into budgets and not to be given as in projects in the format of projects and programs it will be very hard to monitor and I can't see how it can be done with the systems that are, are in place today. Um, le let me start with the, the, the last one, um, and then I'll move back to the capacity. I think from the African point of view, we have always had problems of dealing with, uh, with donors. For each project, you'd find several missions coming from the donor country. And in most cases, each mission wanting to see almost virtually everybody within, within uh, the hierarchy. So during the 90s, we promoted more and worked with the IFIs to see that we had joint programs where there was the donors coming together to finance a budget program or a medium expenditure framework that is designed by, by government. That was in a way reducing uh, uh, the capa I mean, reducing on the requirements on the government, of, of on the government to, to respond to different uh, donors. But even then, uh, you will find some individual donors wanting to work outside that program. I think that's the po same point of 
being accountable to your parliament, you want to say, yes, we built this school, yes, we put up that hospital. Uh, it is a problem. Now, with China and India now coming on board, chances are that ch in the short run, China may not join these joint donor groups because of differences in the type of conditionalities uh, they are setting. And definitely it will be a problem for, for, for the African countries dealing with different uh, donor requirements. Uh, now, your other point is on uh, monitoring outcomes. I think the, my, my view on that is uh, you have to use, uh, monitor it from the point of view of the budget, that yes, I put in these resources and this is what I have been able to achieve. Now, on um, the, the first question on, um, the capacity of, uh, of uh, African countries. Uh, one thing that I would like to bring out is the case of uh, Ethiopia and, uh, and Rwanda. I think those are two very clear cases where the leadership, I think, has a vision of where they want to go. And they can say no to a donor who is providing aid outside the, uh, their medium term expenditure framework outside their priorities. And I think that's what we need to do uh, in, a, in a, a number of countries. We must be, if I can borrow the word used by Paul, we have to be more assertive and uh, know what we want and go into negotiations with donors and say, yes, this is what we want. We are not going to put more money in health. We are not going to put more money in education although your priorities are, is education and, uh, and, uh, and health. Because that's a mistake we did in the 90s where most countries designed their development programs putting a lot of emphasis on health and education because the resource that was available was for health and, uh, and education and we all ignored infrastructure. Now we have the infrastructure gaps and we are trying to catch up. Um, yes. Thank you. Well, uh, let me start with the second question about uh, MSF and others. And um, my, my response to that is thank you so much for uh, raising that. Um, civil, I mean, you, you mentioned civil society and then foundations. Uh, civil society has and should have at the uh, international level and at the national level within Africa a more and more uh, important role. And if you can cite a personal example, I, I've been involved uh, recently in an initiative about a, a, so a global strategy on nutrition, uh, but this is a nutrition initiative without an earmarked fund. And MSF and Helen Keller International and Bread for the World and uh, so m most of the major uh, NGOs, uh, advocacy and operational, uh, have been involved with this, along with UN agencies, along with the donors. And I, and I think it, it moving in a sense to the second uh, question, that is really going to be uh, the path, what we, what we are going to see in the future, if we can come back to the term architecture here. Um, and now, you know, deal the foundation, well, Soros is very big, but wow, just think of Gates and Buffett and what that's gonna mean and their efforts to get other billionaires around to put up money. So I think the, uh, the table is going to get bigger and more complex. And that's where uh, I think um, transparency is, is awfully important. And th there is a major initiative led in fact by the, the British, by, by uh, DFID a uh, international aid transparency initiative. Uh, it's not gonna get China in uh, immediately, but it's making some progress. And you know, the discussion about China, China has made me think of uh, something. The, the next high level forum on aid effectiveness, which is gonna be next year, is gonna be on Kore in Korea. And it's gonna be in Korea, because Korea is an aid donor and Korea is really, in a sense, in the similar position to China. It's smaller, 
but some of the same tensions. And yet, uh, Korea recently w did join the Development Assistance Committee. Uh, but so I, I think w once again, there's room for some kind of middle ground if, if everyone is treated with a certain amount of respect. And if at the same time we recognize, well, of course there are political and commercial interests. And African countries and others need to be aware of that and respond uh, in a, uh, an assertive way. Do we have time just for a couple more questions? Are there uh, over here? Um, yeah, this is very, very interesting. The, what, I, what I don't quite hear, and I'm not sure, it's just, I mean, I'm not uh, that familiar with economics, and I'm not that familiar with the nature of the aid issues, um, but I'm interested that I'm not hearing um, certain kind of structural considerations with respect to the nature of, I mean, the use of the word family was interesting, for example, uh, it, and more anthropological than I'm hearing in other you know, from some of the other speakers. Um, the notion of the theory of the gift, for example, which is that the gift always wants to be returned to the giver. It incurs obligation. It's required that there be a circulation back to those who are giving the gift. And of course, that comes in many forms, political forms and so forth. But what I'm interested in is actually the specific structures in Western culture, say uh, the United States, such as the philanthropic structure or the various uh, federal aid structures that allow the kind of aid to go forward into another continent and to find a place there without assent, in a sense. So I mean, I was interested in the, you know, the reaction to that has to be another structure, a philanthropic structure or, or kind of civil structure that would be able to organize the acceptance of the money in a way that wasn't uh, just uh, passive and, you know, and sort of at the mercy of the gift. And so I really, so I, I'm not exactly hearing, uh, I'm not hearing the economic version of that. So I'd just like to hear. Sure. might be actually paraphrasing what you just said to some degree. But if these uh, donor dollars are liberated from their earmarked agendas and you let local decisions being made as opposed to you know, the global agenda being executed, then my question is to what extent, and not addressing the NGOs and the privatized, you know, the, the institutions that can outskirt the federal, but then the question is to what extent are the governments facilitators versus obstacles? And what I'm saying is how can dollars ensure that representatives or you know officials are actively representing representing the people the constituents can you can this money somehow ensure that connection because it's a, i don't know other ways to bypass that and give it directly to the people that's what okay there are a couple questions down here on the side um, i think this question is related and i was just hoping um, that the gentleman from the Central Ugandan Bank, is that where you, okay. <laughs> um, I was just hoping that you could maybe illustrate for some of us who are non-economists, uh, the procedure by which aid would be a, a factor in sort of planning a medium expenditure for your framework. For example, one of the challenges that was presented today is capacity, and I know that a lot of African go governments don't have the capacity to collect taxes. So. If your plan, if your if you if your a priori problem is that you don't have a, a regular uh, stream of revenue coming in, how do you go about planning a medium expenditure framework? And then once you do, um, how does that shape uh, the location of where of where A can be uh, best utilized? Because I think sort of imagining even be able to even being able to begin to plan a medium expenditure framework when you already uh, you know, have a volatile uh, stream of income is, is a big challenge. And I would just like for you to walk through us, you know, help us imagine the procedure by which you would, Good. you would tackle There's that. There's a question back there. Um, <clears throat> two questions really. One is um, the issue she alluded to, which is capacity. 
it's often the case that a lot of African governments, I'll speak, for instance, for my country, Zimbabwe. I've just spent the last four months working for the World Bank, and it turns out that the central government's capacity to actually do things, to implement, even if they are given money, is very, very limited uh, compared to, say, that of NGOs. You find that you know NGOs like UNICEF have more qualified staff than, say, the government. Um, can you sp is that can you speak to that in terms of what the case is in other African countries and the impact on how aid ends up being um, either effective or not so effective? The second issue is on the issue of the African diaspora. As African countries are kind of crumbling because of the, uh, the issues that they're facing, we're seeing a, a huge migration of people leaving their countries. Um, I can I speak again for my country, which is 25% of the population has left the country, um, mostly like qualified professionals. Um, in the next, say, five, 10 years, I know for a fact that now most of the donors don't really know how to deal with the issue of the diaspora. Do you see, can you comment on that, maybe a model of how that can, the diaspora can be incorporated into making aid more effective? Last question way in the back there. Oh, can you hear me down there? <laughs> Loud and clear. Are you, are you the okay. Okay, okay um, my question is, um, you brought up the, the issue that African countries need to be more assertive and I know in, in some countries there, there are military governments or sometimes the governments are, just, are corrupt or, and there's just a lot of different political issues. So um, how can, um, with the current structure that are in place in some of the actual African countries, like how do you see them being more assertive? Is it gonna be from a policy standpoint or is it gonna be something that is, uh, is on the local level? And you can, in your last word, you can incorporate any other comments you want to. Uh, uh, okay. uh, thanks. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ha having had a chance to have, I say before, I'll try and stick to the questions okay. that have been uh, uh, raised. Um, the, the, the question about sort of the, the cultural side and uh, what a gifts uh, imply, um, I, th I think that's really important. And, you know, as the amount of funding coming from philanthropies in particular increases, uh, and there aren't any rules again, you know, after five decades or so, for better or for worse, there are agreements on rules of the game, Paris and Accra Accords between uh, recipient countries who haven't been assertive enough, but uh, uh, they have a lot more power than they used to, and the donors, well, the philanthropies are kind of unaccountable and they're gonna be huge. And, uh, and it seems to me that there needs to be some way be, uh, of not, uh, of, of an accountability structure other than to their own uh, individual uh, donor so that uh, if we aren't just seeing uh, of this, their own views running, running rampant as the, the amount gets bigger. I, and I think that's really uh, an important uh, issue that you've raised. Now, there have been several questions about, well, can you trust those uh, governments? And um, th those are, are very important questions. If you go back to what Lewis started with, he said, you know, countries are different. Yeah. Um, so, there are some countries that uh, are clearly quite capable. And I hate to, uh, you know, to say it, but as I said in my opening uh, remarks, some of the capable countries indeed are uh, military. The issue for Millennium Development Goals for poverty reduction, rather than for human rights and democracy, and, and human rights and democracy are extremely important, but the issue for poverty reduction and MDGs is, is there, to what extent is there objective development? To what extent are they driven to provide uh, services? And in those countries that are, have shown that they're effectively doing that, 
then there's a real moral dilemma there. And if you really are committed to helping reduce uh, infant mortality, et cetera, um, that, you know, it seems to me that those are governments that have shown that they can do things. They ought to be, the second, the second point is, they certainly ought to be pushed on human rights. And that's where we get back to this question of, you know, conditionality. Well, it's, there's gotta be frank dialogue. You're not going to have conditionality saying you ought to stop being a military uh, government. Um, but the, the, we shouldn't get to the point where the U.S. or any other country doesn't raise these important uh, moral uh, issues, and they, and they have to be dealt with uh, in a frank way. Now, having said that, I, you know, I said, okay, so there's a bunch of capable countries. Of those, some of them we really have issues about uh, human rights, et cetera. There is, there is you know, as Lewis uh, and I were both talking about the fragile states, and there's a lot of them. And frankly, it's a very big challenge because some of them are fragile because they really want desperately to do the right thing, but they don't have the capacity, and you can certainly work with those governments directly. But indeed, there are others where you, the last thing you want to do is turn over large amounts of money directly to them. And there the trick is to find ways to help provide services in the short run, but as Lewis said, also to strengthen the state in the medium term, to think about, you know, is it just going to be a parachuted in health program, or is it going to be something that can lead to something that's uh, sustainable? Thanks. On this issue of uh, trust, how can you trust? At what point do you trust so that you can use the budget uh, as an effective instrument for purposes of uh, improving the welfare of the people? It, it, it can be a difficult call. There are risks that uh, uh, donors will have to take. Take my own country in Uganda. Uh, if one can visited Uganda in 1986 where all state functionaries had been eroded in 86. Your recommendation would have been don't use the budget. Go around the budget in terms of offering services to, to the people. But some countries did actually take risks and worked with the government to strengthen the state. And I think the results now are good in that you have a, f a functioning state. You have uh, a civil service that is is able to to draw up a medium term uh, uh, expenditure framework. So uh, it, I, I can't say that it is a science to decide as to whether you deal with this government or the other government. But uh, you you have to take some risks. Two is the issue of the fragile states. I think there will remain a very big challenge. Fragile states will remain a very big challenge to all of us. And it will always be a very difficult call as to whether the budget is transparent enough and effective as an instrument. A very, very, very difficult call. I, I was sent to Zimbabwe last year in March after the, uh, no, actually it was, uh, yeah, March after the unity government came into power. And the question was, how do we design interventions by the African Development Bank? And uh, I talked to different donors who were on the ground, and you could hear skepticism by many of the donors. I recall going back and uh, giving my report. Where we took some risks and said, no, we will have to deal with the government. And we started relationships with the Ministry of Finance. And uh, you are right, uh, Zimbabwe, many of the professionals left in the case of, uh, of Zimbabwe. The civil service is now much weaker than it was in the 90s. But if you totally avoid government, you use only NGOs to provide the services, then you have this weak government that you are not working with. I think. We have to take some risks and try to see that, yes, maybe in the initial stages we may avoid government, but we know we are going to deal with it within the medium term. We might as well start strengthening it so that it can be an effective instrument. 
So you were right that the, in some of these uh, countries, especially in the weak states, even planning itself, coming up with a government plan, can be very difficult. In fact, you may be dealing in a situation where there is no plan. But that might mean that you will have to work with different ministries, different players, so that you come up with a, a, a plan. Now, one of the other questions was that, uh, what if the government is not representative of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the views of the people? You may find that even the NGOs may not be. They may also have an agenda. So this is never an easy. Uh, easy question for, for, for anybody. Now, the other point was uh, how do we involve the diaspora uh, in uh, assisting these weak governments? Can we find ways of tapping in some of the skills in the diaspora? I, I think the diaspora have got a, ve a very big role to play in their home governments. We have to find ways of attracting some of these people uh, back in their countries. But they will not become a substitute to a weak government. I don't think that that should be the direction we should take. Uh, I know the UN has uh, looked at uh, various ways of getting the diaspora back. But at times they also create distortions. You find someone in a ministry receiving maybe $2,000 and the, the other people reporting to this one individual are receiving the equivalent of $10 a month. I mean, it doesn't work. You can't have only one person running a whole ministry. So uh, it, we have to find ways, but I don't have easy answers to all these very difficult uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let me just uh, uh, remind, uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, both Lewis and Paul for coming from such distances. Um, this Friday, uh, Saskia Sassing's City and Echo Crises Conference is part of the Echogram, and it will be here in uh, Wood Auditorium from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, so for those of you who felt this was too short, uh, that this will make up for uh, those of you uh, who like a longer conference. Uh, next week on Thursday, uh, October 7th at 6 p.m., um, as a follow-up to tonight's panel, we are sponsoring a screening of our friends at the bank uh, in Warren Hall, room 310. Uh, it's a really interesting movie. I encourage you to go. It, it, it is uh, the story of uh, some negotiations uh, between Uganda and uh, the bank and the IMF. Uh, and it's uh, a documentary that uh, was remarkably frank. I think uh, the bank regretted it. Uh, so uh, I really do uh, encourage you to, to see it. Uh, uh, it, it, it. These institutions may have changed. It's a, it's a little while from them, but at least it's a nice historical uh, look at what things were like and maybe like today. And um, uh, uh, there'll be a whole series of programs uh, on, from the Committee of Global Thought on Africa uh, which uh, will be posted uh, as they get uh, finalized. So let me again thank you all for coming. Thank you particularly. <laughs>